Wes Goldberg, cold open question of the day. Clay Thompson, in his exit interview, I would say got a little bit existential. He got a little bit, you could tell he's processing, I think, the way he played against the Kings, processing his future, wondering what it's going to be. What did you make of what he said, what Curry said, what Kerr said, what, what Draymond said about wanting him back and just how Clay approached getting asked about his future? Yeah, I thought the Clay Thompson part of it was the most interesting part where he does, to use your word, get a little defensive. He wants to do, you know, um, Anthony Slater from The Athletic asks him right off the bat, hey, what's up with your free agency? And Clay is like, hey, we just played a whole season. Like, why can't we just talk about that? Like, it was a long year. Are we just ready to spin things forward? And Slater basically is just like, yeah, dude, like, it, it's a huge topic is your unrestricted free agency. And, you know, I get it. Like, I don't, I don't. I always kind of feel like I take I don't really understand how fans feel about stuff because I'm always kind of taking the journalistic side of these things. Mm -hmm. But I do think that most Warriors fans are like, yeah, dude, we've heard about this season during the season. You get asked about every game after every game. Like we're sort of ready to talk about the offseason now um, because it is inappropriate to talk about it as much during the season. But when the season's over, it's time for offseason talk. And so, um, you know, but Clay's been in a very reflective mood if you've kind of saw his quotes and listened to his press conferences over the year. Like he's, he talks about how great of a ride that this has been and how his career won't last forever. So he's kind of entered this new space in terms, in terms of being a reflective thinking guy, which is a cool new version of Clay Thompson that I appreciate, but he's got a lot of thinking to do this summer also. And he's not going to get some enormous contract you know I, there's been reports that maybe there's going to be something on the table from the Warriors at around 20 million dollars per year that seems about right to me can he get more he's going to have to go see as an unrestricted free agent and then if he does uh, procure a, a bigger uh, contract offer from somewhere else then he has to make a decision whether or not he wants to leave Golden State uh, if that offer does indeed come and uproot his life and move somewhere else and, and go to play for another franchise after he's only played for one for his entire career. So, you know, if Clay Thompson wants to reflect and think and all that stuff, like he's going to have plenty of time to do that this summer over the next few months. I don't, I can't see him going anywhere else, Wes. I, I just can't. It makes me too sad to think about him being in a Pistons jersey or a Magic jersey or just something of that ilk, right? Like it, it would just frankly be a little bit too depressing. What I've, what I've, and I also empathize with him wanting to just talk about the moment and reflect. That's, I guess, just not like, there, that's one of the disconnects, I guess, between players and media. That's like not our job to mm -hmm. like help you, like, we are not there to help you process and give you like kind of like softball questions about, you know, you making it through this year pretty healthy and, and all that stuff. Like, our job is to ask what people want to know. If someone got to ask Clay Thompson any question, it's going to be, what is your future going to be? Like, that's just what it is. I, You're a free agent. That's what happens. If you were under contract, yeah. then that conversation wouldn't happen. It would be very different. It would be like, what did you learn from this season that you could take into next season to accomplish your goals? Do you still think that you're a championship organization, a championship team? Like, you could do that whole thing. But he's a franchise icon. He's legendary. Multiple rings. Four rings. Unrestricted free agency kind of on the downslope of your career. This is the story, to your point. This is the most interesting free agency that I think is a fait accompli, that it's just he's going to go back, that I, I just what it looks like, the structure of the deal, paired with Kuminga extension. So you think it's a fait accompli? You think it's over? You think he's going back? I just think when Kerr and Draymond and, like, when Kerr, Clay, sorry, Kerr, Curry, and Draymond all say, we want him back, I don't know, and, like, I don't know how you can't bring him back. I also just like really don't want to imagine a world where he's like on another. It just will not no. look right. I know that happens, and I know I'm holding on to something nostalgic in a world that like in a in a business that is nostalgia is for losers and like it doesn't exist really. I just can't imagine him like on the like like it would be too weird to me if he just goes somewhere else. It would be kind of sad. Yeah, but it is the norm, isn't it? I mean, every time we think it's weird for a legendary player from an organization to play for a different organization, almost always, inevitably, that player ends up playing for a different organization. It just kind of always happens. Like, Joe Montana played for the Kansas City Chiefs. Like, there's always a weird God. thing that happens at the end of a player's career. 
And it's very rare that there's sort of this storybook ending. And I'm not saying that's out of the cards. I'd still probably agree with you that Clay ends up back in Golden State. But also the other part I took from Steph's and uh, recent quotes is that he wants to win. And he was also basically saying, like, yeah, obviously I want to play with Draymond and, and Clay and all these things, but I want to win first and foremost. And if moving on from Clay Thompson helps the Warriors win a championship or, or get back to contending status, then they're going to explore that very seriously. Now, I'm not sure that that's the case. I still think that Clay Thompson can be a useful player for them at the right price. But if if things if negotiations go sideways, like who knows what happens here? So I'm not ruling anything out. So you said $20 million. We'll end this cold open on this. Here's the teams with $20 million plus in cap space this summer. I want you to tell me which of these teams would be the weirdest to, to see Clay Thompson on. San Antonio. Okay, so here's the six. Magic, Spurs, Thunder, Jazz, Sixers, Pistons. It you say San Antonio. J- no, but the Jazz would be really – that would be really strange. That would be th- that would be the most weird. There's no reason for I'd- him to go to the Utah Jazz. No offense to Salt Lake City or the Jazz, but you're going – like you're not at the stage of your rebuilding process where you're acquiring 34-year-old, 33-year-old, however Clay Thompson is, uh, declining three-point shooters. Like that's not – that's not the part of the rebuild that they're in, so that would be the weirdest one. I think it's the Pistons. Jazz are like one A, but the Pistons are one. Um, I they're see like the, the Pistons op- at least being like, you know what the Houston Rockets did last summer, where they oh just got God. veterans who were winning, and it just like turned around the culture. Let's do that, right? And I'm just gonna tell you, Wes, if they if they pay Tobias Harris and Clay Thompson a lot of money, we're not talking about them all of next season. I just will refuse to acknowledge that they exist. They will deserve to be shamed as they finish with like the 13th best record in the East. Still, okay, like that's 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 the saddest way you could spend your money, right? Uh, but they might do it. Oh hey, God. we need uh, some shooting out uh, next to uh, Jaden Ivey and Kate Cunningham. That's what's really gonna take us to the next level. Yeah, I had a friend who lives in Detroit tell me that he saw he sees Jaden Ivy jerseys on on discount at like sporting goods stores now. So like we'll read three. Sign that, Clay we'll Thompson well. as an unrestricted free agent and trade a couple yeah. of the young pieces for Draymond. And pay Tobias Harris, which has been like I do it all. Let's like like round it up. Let's go. Let's get Kate and Kate to I just try to Wiseman import been, Warriors yeah. oh culture into Detroit. There's always been the Draymond Green connection because of Michigan. It just makes sense. Go ahead and do that, Pistons. That'll turn everything around. Yeah, that'll absolutely fix your problems. All right, coming up on today's show, we're going to react to some playing games. We're going to debate who would be the more interesting eight seed between the two games left on Friday, and we're going to do a ranking of the series in terms of watchability. That's coming up today on the Just Basketball Show. Welcome in to the Just Basketball Show. I am Chris Manning, here with my guy Wes Goldberg. If you haven't already, please follow, rate, review the show on your podcast app platform of choice. Hit subscribe on the Just Basketball Fans YouTube channel. You can find us on TikTok, Instagram, and X. Uh, Wes just did a really good Luca video for YouTube that you can go check out as well. Uh, we're going to award I think stuff. He's the MVP. He thinks he's the MVP. Check that out for the full reasons why. I got to tell you, might be swayed. Might be joining you on, on Luca for MVP Island. Want to tell you about our friends at Thrive Fantasy as well. Thrive Fantasy is a player prop DFS platform where you can pick more or less on your favorite players across multiple sports, including the NBA and the NFL. Sign up today with code Just Basketball and Thrive will match your first deposit up to $250. Wes, I hate to do this to you. We got to start with Heat 76ers. We just we just got to do it. You covered this really well in Locked on Heat. That was my first listen uh, on Friday. Very good. So, look, we're out, we're out here. We're supporting the homies. Appreciate the promo there. <laughs> That's right. Here's, the, here's what made me bummed about this game is that you could just tell Jimmy was not right from the moment that that fall happened. And I don't even really believe that Joel Embiid is right. So it's not like there was like a massive opportunity for Philly – because Embiid was good. It was like Jimmy got hurt, was clearly not the same guy the rest of the way. Obviously, we know now he's not going to play um, on Friday. Although his agent, I saw a quote from his agent where he said they're still exploring everything. Shout out Bernie Lee, I guess. But this was not a game that Miami just had the juice after the after the 
the the Butler injury. And I wonder to you, what else stood out? Like, what was that the number one thing, or what what stood out to you from this game from other uh, side? This is why you don't fall into the playing tournament in the first place. This is exactly the reason. Uh, two things. You have to play uh, another game or two extra that are outside your schedule, which inherently risks uh, or ups the risk profile for injury. And we saw that happen with Jimmy Butler. So that's the first reason why you don't want to be in the playing tournament. The second reason that you don't want to be in the playing tournament is because something like Nick Batum going off for 20 plus points and getting hot from three point range when the guy's been averaging five points a game all season can happen in a one game sample, right? Like that variance that's introduced into everything can happen and can completely flip the game is and that's what happened you're right the injury didn't matter jimmy butler was hobbled joel Embiid looked like 50 percent of what he could be out there he was that guy didn't want to move up and down the court and so the heat had enough to get this to get this win and advance into the playoffs and play the knicks in the first round and instead nick batum was like i'm just getting hot and they the sixers kept feeding him the ball and he kept making shots and the Sixers are the ones playing the Knicks in the first round, and the Heat are the ones that got to play on Friday night. And it can happen on Friday night too, right? We're a year away from the Heat being in this exact same situation where Max Struess went off for 31 points against the Chicago Bulls. The Heat go into the playoffs instead of Chicago. They play the Milwaukee Bucks in the first round. Giannis hurts his back, and then the Heat go on to a run to the NBA Finals. But none of that happens if some role player doesn't go off for a career night. And... This is everything that happens in the playing tournament. So it's not so much to say is that he deserved what happened to them, but it just felt like the right culmination of what this season has been. And it's why you can't lose bad games to the Wizards and the Grizzlies. It's why you got to take the regular season a little bit more seriously. It's why you need more from Jimmy Butler over the first 82 games. Um, because you just don't know how many playoff games you're really going to have, right, in order to summon playoff Jimmy. Like, you just need a little bit more from him in the regular season. And so that's where the Heat ended up. They ended up getting a bad break on Wednesday. They'll try to make up for it on Friday. But even at the other side of that would be the, the Boston Celtics as opposed to the New York Knicks, who I don't know that the Heat would – like, the Heat would not have been favored in either series, but the Knicks eminently more beatable – than the Celtics, and um, it's just going to be a tough draw. Bigger questions, I think, about what's coming from Miami, I think we'll get to in the summer. On the Philly side of this, what did you make of Embiid? He has 11, I believe, of his, of his points in the fourth. He did enough late, but you, know, you Brent, and I were texting about this. He looked timid, I think, in spots. He certainly didn't look super nimble. I don't think he looked above 60 percent if we're being generous for much of this game for me that gives me concern about what we're going to get you know in the Knicks series and, and what he can provide in a series where he's obviously going to be vital and he's vital to whatever this team is going to accomplish I didn't come away from this game less convinced that the best version of Embiid and, and Embiid who can carry a team through a playoff series who can help this team make a, a run to the Eastern Conference Finals as a as a seven seed. I didn't totally feel like that guy was there. Obviously they have personnel that fits really well around him. You know, Maxi could have a really big game and, and all that stuff. But I didn't feel like the best player on that team was exactly who you might need him to be if you're gonna maximize this playoff run. That that was my takeaway. Uh, that's that's got to be really concerning if you're a Sixers fan is watching Joel Embiid just not want to go up and down the court, um, bending down and putting his hands on his knees on every opportunity, not closing out on the perimeter. And the Heat made it easy for him to just stand there, but that's basically all he did was just stand there. And um, yeah, I don't. I, you said sixty percent. I'd put it at fifty percent. But the thing is, yeah. like the Sixers only needed him at like 75, 80% of what he was prior to the injury for them to actually have a chance in the Eastern Conference. And I don't know that he can get sort of that extra 25 to 30% in health between now, like in the three days between now and the first playoff game. And then the other part of it too is like, so Joel Embiid, obviously he came back. I thought he looked better when he first returned first, mm -hmm. how he looked in that play-in game. I know he, he, he's, he's, had that that scare a couple nights ago uh, on Friday night wasn't able, uh, before the end of the regular season didn't play in the final se regular season game on Sunday and then he had this game but that Sunday game to a Wednesday game is about the same amount of time that he had off that he's going to have off between the Wednesday game 
in the first playoff game over the weekend. And I just don't know that he's going to be able to get to where he needs to get to. And then even if he does get to it, can he stay at that level for four wins in a seven game series? And that would be my concern right now. So yeah, I don't know. I if if he looks anything like that, then I'm taking the Knicks in that series. It it, ha- it made me wonder if it would have been better if and obviously like you think rest is better, time off is better, gives him a chance to heal. I wonder if he would have just been better off building and playing and getting in a rhythm. Like he got taken back out of his rhythm, and maybe this isn't as drastic, but it's not. This isn't great. Like I. This isn't the way you would, I think, want this to go if you're Philly. And maybe they feel like this is found money because they have all this money to spend and whatever. But I, every season, I think, with Embiid is got to be maximized considering what we know his injury history is. I think that's just that's just a, a fact of life if you're him. It reminds me a little bit of what Denver went through in the non-Jamal Murray years mm. when he was dealing with his injury. That was basically just lost seasons. You know, the, the Nuggets were good enough to win the championship in 2022. Jamal Murray didn't play that year. Um, and But what they did have is whatever that I, – I forget how many games it was, but it was like a couple of weeks or something where it was after the Aaron Gordon trade. Jamal Murray was healthy. It was before he got hurt um, in Golden State in the game that basically cost him a whole season uh, or the injury that cost him the whole season. And then it was like a, a small sample where they just looked awesome, where they had Jamal Murray, Nikola Jokic, Michael Porter Jr., Aaron Gordon, like all these pieces working together. And you're like, wow, we see the vision. And then it was just stripped away from them all of a sudden. And they didn't get to see it again for a very long time. And then once we saw them, once they got healthy, it was like, oh, here we go. And they go ahead and win a championship. I'm not predicting a championship in the future for the Sixers. But I think we did see, if you want to if you want to find like a silver lining for this season, if you're the Sixers, proof of concept of what this group can be. Tyrese Maxey and Joel Embiid, that's a two-headed monster. That's that's a that's a tandem that you can ride to a championship. They can be that – when healthy, they're that good together. We know the kind of pieces that you need around that. I don't know that you necessarily need a star that would just take the ball. I think give Embiid the ball. He's the best at having the ball in the league in terms of a point-per-possession scoring basis. Tyrese Maxey's awesome. Um, I think you just get really good role players who can fall into, into place around those guys – and then, yeah, that team can win the East, and that team can win a championship. So, yeah, I think for the Sixers, you got proof of concept, and unfortunately it was just sort of marred by injury. You just hope that you can get back and be healthy next season. All right, let's go to Bulls-Hawks. Not a ton to me here, Wes. This, the Bulls winning just feels right, frankly, considering how banged up Atlanta is. No Jalen Johnson, no Nyeka Kongwu. They got good games, you know, from Clint Capella. They got, you know, Trey Young at least it was had something going for him in some ways. DeJounte Murray put up a lot of shots as he's wont to do as of late. But Chicago just straight up better. And the Kobe the season of Kobe White for Chicago, I think, was really the, the that continuing was the biggest deal. This wasn't a DeMar DeRozan puts thirty five on you in a in a game by via footwork in mid range. This was the Kobe White show in most ways for Chicago. That guy, to me, you know, I, he's probably not going to win most improved player. I don't. I haven't looked at the odds. He wasn't the favorite last time I had looked. But I saw this absurd stat. This is, uh, since turn, this is from NBA, NBA's official stats account. Kobe White joins a, a guy named Michael Jordan, who did this five times. Just, you know, just this guy named Michael. I don't know if people have heard of him. He's the Kobe White and Michael Jordan are the only two Bulls players ever to have 40 plus points, five plus assists, and zero turnovers in any game since turnovers started being recorded in 1977 and 1978. That's the 77 78 season. This is just an amazing Kobe White game, and I am just in on whatever, whatever version of the Bulls we are going to get going forward. Kobe White has absolutely just played himself into that. They're probably going to get smoked if they make it into the playoffs here. They might lose Friday. Kobe White's legit. I love him. I'm really glad that he has, he has found himself. Yeah, I was about to say before you brought up the Michael Jordan stats that Kobe White is sort of what the Bulls had been hoping Zach Levine would be in terms of, okay, we don't need to ask 34-year-old, 35-year-old DeMar DeRozan to be that scorer. Like now he could more pick his spots and be sort of the efficient guy. And now we have this lead ball handler who we can run our offense through. But 
maybe I was aiming too low with Zach Levine. Maybe this is the guy that they've been waiting for since Michael Jordan <laughs> in Chicago. So look, obviously hyperbole, but like, well, his knees work at least, you know, awesome. like he's at least healthy, you know, like there, there's at least that. Yeah. Well, this, this just makes what you need not to turn everything into a team building exercise here uh, because the bulls still have another game to go and they can get into the playoffs here and, and, you know, making the playoffs is a big deal for the Chicago bulls and it should be. Um, even if you do lose to the Celtics, like it's an, it's an important accomplishment, but um, it might lower the urgency in terms of what you need to get back for Zach Levine, right? Because when they were shopping him before the deadline, it was, we heard all the reports of what they were looking for, for Levine, and they weren't able to get anything even close to that. And Levine is still on the books, but they need to shed that salary. I think you could pretty much just salary dump him now and feel pretty good about having Kobe White as a guy you could build your your offense. Maybe not around. I don't know that he's that guy yet, but he could definitely be a, a foundational piece of a really good offense. They're 12th in offensive rating since the All-Star break. They're even better than that, uh, like in the last 10 to 15 games of the regular season. They just hung up points on the Atlanta Hawks. And by the way, the Hawks, I don't know that I've seen a team least less interested in the play-in tournament than the Atlanta Hawks. When Trey Young walked off the floor, he almost looked happy. Yeah. Was my first was my first reaction to watching him. Like that team does not want to be here. How doesn't it feel like ten years ago that he's he like asserted himself as like one of the NBA's leading villains because of him beating the Knicks and the ice tray and, and they make the com- the the Eastern Conference and finals. He's winning over Atlanta I mean, he was even like, I know he was making fun of New York fans and MSG, but like, that's exactly what New Yorkers like. So he was even winning over but his, the, the heat on him, the series. heat on him was so good that like, I, I don't even know why I know this exactly, but they, he got brought out at a, I think a WWE event at MSG to get like purposely booed. It was like a, it was like a thing and he came out and he, I guess he's a wrestling fan, but he came out and he did the ice tray thing. And it was like, there was a thing happening and now it's like, what like I don't understand what what like has the like we we Brendan and I have talked about this but it feels like the this this is the kind of thing that if you are like a bona fide star some of this this doesn't pass you by he feels like he's mixed by is he had like the Brad Beal zone is that where we've ended up with Trey mm. we might be there he's the best player in the league with no fans <laughs> there. Hawks, Atlanta people don't want – they don't like Trey Young. They, they're ready to trade him. Like, he's the best player in the league with no fans. The only people who like Trey Young are the people who watch highlights on TikTok. Is like little kids who are following the league based on TikTok and don't understand that the Hawks are not a good basketball team. And you know, that's a fine way to consume the league. If that's what you want to do, that's fine. But, um, but, yeah, he's the best player in the league that does not have any fans. Tough tough and losing to like the bulls who again a lot of solid nba guys like guys who could play in other teams but it's like what are we what are we doing here like bulls aren't good all right bulls heat preview we're not gonna preview this game but wes i ask you this who would be the more interesting eight seed for the boston celtics to probably like beat in five games Mm. we would think who are you more interested considering jimmy butler is out who's more interesting to actually play the Celtics yeah it'd be easy to overanalyze this but I'm not going to in terms of interest level it's the Miami Heat I mean it's Heat Celtics with or without Jimmy Butler could you imagine if the Heat went into Boston without Jimmy Butler in one of these two games and somehow stole a game in Boston what the radio waves in Boston would be like for 24 to 48 hours it would be bedlam it would be nuts like the TV programming I would you would have to drag me off my couch for the for those twenty four hours, it would be incredible. Um, that's the more interesting thing here. The Bulls are uh, very staunchly and, and proudly almost not interesting, <laughs> but uh, it's so that's the interesting one in terms of uh, once you like viability as a playoff team. It's the Chicago Bulls, considering that Miami's best player is going to be out for several weeks with an M, uh, an MCL sprain. Uh, but I don't know that any of it is terribly interesting, considering that we're probably looking at a sweep by the Boston Celtics. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I <laughs> it's interesting because people would still kind of like the Heat thing. They would find a way, like just seeing what Eric Spolster would do to game plan for that series without Butler would be fascinating. We, I feel like we learn a lot about Tyler Hero and a lot about Bam Adebayo 
Maybe more about Hero. I feel like I already know a lot about Bam. My answer is maybe just Chicago West, just because I'm like, okay, if I'm going to watch these series, it might only be four games. Maybe five. I just want to see who who's going to be the most insane trying to score on the Celtics guards. And my answer is Kobe White. Like, I would rather watch him try to process score against Derek White, against Drew Holiday, and DeRozan doing the same against Tatum and Brown. Like, at least... I'm not saying that's, like, exciting or competitive, the lines on those games. What you're describing is excitement of, like, the first 10 minutes yeah. of the series. Yeah. And then realizing that he's – even if he can do it to a degree, it's not going to be nearly yeah. enough what the Bulls need to make that a series. Yes. So I understand where you're coming from, but also no <laughs> miss me with it. It's, it's not – it's No, it's – I, I, I don't know if <laughs> – What's interesting is how many points the Bulls could put up, the the or, or the the Celtics could put up. I'm sorry, the Bulls, <laughs> 27th in defensive rating yeah. since the All Star break. How many how many points can Boston hang? Could they break 200 in regulation? Would be maybe the most interesting. Yeah, thing yeah. How many? Uh, how badly does Chris Depp's Porzingis play Nikola Vucevic and Andre Drummond? Is just like a question. Do so you just rest Porzingis in that series? Just save him for the second round. You Luke know? Cornette just, time? Now, now I'm just being Just angry. Luke Cornette yeah. time? Just Luke, hey, just close out really aggressively. You know, we're going to – Sam Hauser just drops like a 40 ball. Like, that That seems possible. I guess like ba- I guess like the heat thing, you at least know they would be competitive. They would at least like try to make it annoying. Yeah. So that's maybe the answer. That's maybe the answer. I don't know. The Can answer. they get Deion Waiters back to like replace Jimmy? Can we do that? He's not doing anything. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Why not? I'd be cool with that. <laughs> All right, so other game, Kings Pelicans. I think the answer here is the Kings, and I don't think it's close just because Zion is out. Like it's just kind of that to me. It's not. I don't want to like say that Brandon Ingram and T.J. McCollum are are not like interesting. Like they can both get hot, but like Ingram coming off the injury stuff didn't look particularly good in the play-in game. We kind of know exactly what McCollum is in a playoff setting. The Kings at least have Fox and have Sabonis and are going to play at a tempo. They're going to be really well coached by Mike Brown. They're scrappy. Like, I'm going to go Kings over Pelicans, and mostly just because Zion's not healthy, and that, that matters. Zion is the entertainment factor. He's the one that you buy the popcorn for when you're in New Orleans, right? It's um, So without him, yeah, I, I agree with you. There's things that I like about the Pelicans. I'm very much here for the Trey Murphy and Herb Jones show, uh, but that's more of like, regular season Wes is staying up late at night and just needs something to watch kind of entertainment um not necessarily like playoff entertainment the kings are interesting in this specific matchup also uh because sabonis is the kind of player who could give the thunder some problems and if if he really ramps up the physicality of it like his his just sort of like whirling dervish play and like throwing elbows and getting black eyes and all that stuff. Like, I don't know that Chet Holmgren wants to deal with that mm. in the first round of the playoffs. You know what I mean? Like, they can they could get pretty physical when they want to. The Kings can. I'm not – I would by no means pick the Kings in this, in this series. But I do think that it would be an, a nice little healthy dose of physicality. Not as much as the Pelicans could have offered had Zion been healthy. But given mm. – where these two teams are from a health perspective. I think the Kings right now, the more physical team and they're going to, if they do win, that would probably be the more interesting part is, all right, how do the, how do the thunder deal with this level of physicality uh, against a team that employs big men for 48 minutes. And that's sort of like the one thing against the thunder that people have questions about. Plus, you know, their age, um, two relatively young teams between the thunder and the Kings going at it. But yeah, I, I would, I would probably go in that direction. Plus, I'm just interested in any series that the Thunder are playing, mm-hmm. and I don't really care about the opponent. To me, like they're the, they're the movie star, and I don't really care about who the co like the co star is. I don't care about the best supporting actor or actress in this in the series. I'm I'm here to watch the Oklahoma City Thunder play. Um, so this this series is going to be entertaining to me, no matter. Yeah, what. I'm I'm with you on that, and I think Chet and defending Sabonis and seeing like how much rebounding could matter in a, in a playoff series for the Thunder would be interesting enough. Which would if, if let's just say let's just go and say it's Heat, Celtics, Kings, Thunder. Which of those series is more likely to go six? Mm. Um, that's a good question. I I'll, I'll probably just go Kings, Thunder, because of the 
the youth of the Thunder, do they maybe not ramp up into playoff gear? The the Kings are at least a year removed from being in a really competitive playoff series with the Warriors. Um, and I just don't I don't know that, you know, they, they have something that they can rely on, right? They just know that they can go to the De'Aaron Fox, DeMontis Sabonis pick and roll. And without Jimmy Butler, I just think the Heat are going to be working to find themselves for a little bit here. Um, if they do make it that far. So I would probably go the Kings. Yeah, I agree. I think it's no Jimmy just kind of means I think it's, it's yeah. the Kings, unfortunately. All right, let's get into ranking some series watchability. We're going to just pick every series how good we think it's actually going to be to watch. But first, got to tell you about our friends at Homage. Homage is the ultra comfortable specialty apparel company with NBA and WNBA licenses. They use its vintage inspired designs to pay homage to the greatest stories, traditions, and figures across sports, music, and pop culture. Use the link below to make your purchase and support the Just Basketball Show. All right, so here are all the – yeah, hit me, Wes. What's up? It's just spring in this Yeah, moment. I love it. Uh, we're going to do a pre, pre-show pre meeting during the yeah, show. That's good. Um, why don't we draft them? Okay. And here's the stakes. They're not real stakes. They're fake stakes just for, for entertainment purposes, but that's showbiz, baby. Yeah. Um, the series you draft are the only series you're allowed to watch. So that's what's at stake Oh, boy. Here. Okay. I like so this. So if we put it sort of within that prism of we're going to draft playoff series, and those are the only series we're allowed to watch in the first round. That's what we're talking about here. And because this is my bad idea, you get to have the first pick. Okay. Um, you know what? No. Let's, let's just go more chaos. I'm going to flip a coin. <laughs> oh, God. Do you have a coin? I'm going to use a website, Wes. Okay. I... I you know, website is that a Bitcoin? Is that what a Bitcoin is? <laughs> That's what Dogecoin is, actually. You just flip it, and it, it, you find out if you're rich or not. Um, that's, how that, that's how that works. I, I'm gonna, you're, You can call it heads or tails. Call right now. Tails. Always. All right, so it's, it, it was heads. So I, I, right, you, so are, we going, are we going snake or back and forth? Back and right. forth. There's only two people. Snake draft and two people is yeah, That's true. I'm going to go first pick, and I'm taking Clippers Mavericks. And if you think this is number one, you're a fucking moron, is, is my opinion. Yeah. Like, I'm. This is the Victor Webanyama of the draft. Is, can is can we also just say sh- Victor Webanyama going on the record in his interview with Kevin O'Connor being like, I don't like partying. I don't like alcohol. I just like. Like. The opposite Zion energy from Zion when he's like talking about Dallas. You know, <laughs> like, it's just. It's pretty good. So I remember talking with uh, his trainer that he worked with for a few years, uh, Tim Martin, uh, for a, a story that I was working on about one of his other clients. And then it was it was like months before. It was like right when the Wemby stuff really was like kind of picking up like a year and a half ago. And I was like, what's going on with this? Like, you work with this Victor Wembanyama guy? And he goes, yeah, yeah. I'm like, is this guy the real deal? And he like just could not stop talking about how this guy just has the right attitude. He's super competitive. He was like mentioning like all he cares about basketball. Like he was talking about like guy does not party, does not drink, doesn't want any of that stuff. He's not going after the models, like none of that stuff. The dude is just in the gym working on something. And he's like, he's got that LeBron thing where every year he's going to come back having added something new. And that quote has stuck with me in my own like little private conversation. Because, and I don't think you would mind me sharing that. I don't know if there's necessarily an offer in the on-the-record conversation right now. But whatever. It's been a couple of years. But, like, what else is this dude going to add if that's legit? Like, if that's really how this guy is, it's like, all right, cool. Is he going to be making, like, fadeaway three-pointers next year? I don't I don't know what it's going to be. But, yeah. Um, interesting interview. And uh, that's your first pick. Well, let, Clipper, do you want to yeah, dissect let, it? Clipper like, Mavericks? this is – this. Let's. I'm just going to make the case. I think even if people – like, just make the case for all these series – it's we've seen it before in a different era for both teams, and it was great then. You even just tell me I get to watch Luca like twenty possessions of Luca attacking Kawhi one on one. I'm there, like I I am there, excited, eyes glued to the television. You throw Kyrie into this, and the way he has played, and the way he has, I think, seamlessly really fit with Luca in a way that I I think I maybe underrated at the beginning of the year. That Dallas team right now was just playing awesome basketball. Is I think has if momentum is a thing, they have more of it right now than the Clippers. The Clippers, meanwhile, have a ton of pressure on them. They have I think the sec to, to me the second best coach in the league in Ty, in Ty Lue. They still have Kawhi, who's been awesome this entire year. They theoretically should have the deeper, better team. 
they've been better probably for more chunks of this year, but the the late the late part of the season definitely I think favored Dallas. I think this series is going to be long and competitive and close. I would be shocked if one team just blew out the other one. I think this is just as close as you can get to high stakes, guaranteed competitive games, lots of stars. I think it, has, it is as close as you can get to in a first-round series to being a guarantee of checking every box you would want for playoff basketball. This is, like you mentioned... Uh, we have seen this movie before, but this is like taking the Fast and Furious movies and then just adding Jason. Making that them well, rock making later. them good. You mean just, like actually like if they if if Fast yeah. and Furious was good, like can you like what's a, what's a good what's a good? I, I'm not a Fast and Furious guy. I'm just throwing shots. So you, all right, if people came here for uh, Fast and Furious opinions, they got it. They're, they're, <laughs> um, but the point being is that this was already a series. We knew sort of what this was all about, right? We had it was Luca versus. Kawhi and Paul George, him breaking down what was supposed to be this great perimeter defensive duo and just transcending all of that with supernova basketball play and changing the way we even think about him. Even the people who were the biggest Luka fans were on, or just only left those playoff series even more bullish about his future. Well, guess what? Luka has leveled up since then. And he's gotten Kyrie now as a co-star. And... By the way, the Clippers have the whole James Harden experience, which if you're a fan of the Clippers might be a little troubling. If you're a fan of basketball and just the basketball history, you're just like, oh, what egg is he going to lay today? Like, this is kind of interesting. And, you know, the, everything with Kawhi, if, if he could just be that guy, if he could be that version of Kawhi again, then we've really got something here. I think in terms of vibes, heavily leaning towards Oh, yeah, Dallas. not even question. Maybe too much. I, I, I'm not sucked in by the Clippers. I fell for that once, even though I told myself I'd never do it. I fell for it once in January, February, and uh, they betrayed me and everybody else, and I'm not going to fall for it again. However, there is a world where they come out and they look a lot more like the team they looked like in January, where they looked like, frankly, the best team in the NBA, and less like the team that they've looked like over the last two months. And if that happens, then we're going to have a really great series. Um, and, and, you know, everything then changes but yeah this is easily the number one pick and i think what we could be seeing here is if luca does go up that next level like this could springboard a finals mm -hmm. like that's sort of what's at stake here you know what i mean so um it's a great number one pick i'm really upset that i'm not allowed to watch it so um my next pick is gonna be let's see here i'm gonna go I'm gonna go Nuggets Lakers. Okay. I'm. Go mm -hmm. I'm fat. I'm. I'm intrigued. This is where you went because I. This is on my two list, and I think I'm. I think I would have ended up going somewhere different, but I get it because you do have you do have Jokic, LeBron, Anthony Davis, and Jamal Murray like that. And the the matchups yeah. are awesome. The matchups are awesome. Uh, Anthony Davis did a really interesting job against Nikola Jokic in the in the Western Conference Finals, the most competitive sweep of all time. We all heard it. <laughs> Um, so you get all that from an X's and O's perspective, though, I'm here for it. I think Anthony Davis is having the best defensive season of his career. Fascinated to just see him try against Nikola Jokic, LeBron James playoffs. I'm here for it. Maybe the greatest player of all time, the greatest player of this generation. Give it to me in a playoff setting. It was fun last year. It's always fun. I lo like that. It's, it's not that complicated, but we can get more complicated. If you'd like, we could do all the X's and O's stuff. It's interesting. Um, like LeBron James trying to figure it out again. Like all that stuff is, is there. Um, also Michael Malone doing quite a bit of trash talking about the Lakers since the last time these teams met in the playoffs, Anthony Davis doing quite a bit of trash talking. So we got all the off the court kind of things, the rivalry that's really sparked here. All that is at the table. Um, also there's LeBron James under a fair bit of pressure. And Chris, I'd like at this uh -oh. moment to debut my list of top five players under the most pressure this playoff run. Are you yeah, ready? let's go. All right, number five is LeBron James. I, He's just going to be under pressure to win another ring until he... Even wins. though he doesn't... That's why he's number Even five. though he does not need to. It's under... He's, he's under his own pressure. He doesn't need to necessarily, but boy, if he got one... I just feel like that would 
it would change, I think, a lot of people that are on Michael Jordan's side, maybe to LeBron. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong there. Maybe just the Michael Jordan people are too devout. But uh, I'm going to go LeBron number five. Only because, and I'm not, you're right, I don't feel great about it. He's under a lot of pressure to get out of the first round, I think. But, I mean, he, he I has to uphold, Wes, the honor of being an NBA Cup champion. Like, what does it even mean, you know? That's true. He does have that, so maybe he's under. No, no, no. I mean, no. It's that. I'm saying more pressure because, like, what does the NBA? Like, oh, I know, but I know what does that. it even mean? Like, if you won it, and then you get bounced in the playoffs. Well, if LeBron, if you lose in the first round, then LeBron gets to walk away. He's like, well, I have the NBA Cup, and they don't. <laughs> and then he gets to put some <laughs> slap some. That's right. On yeah, that that's trophy. right. All right. The the fifth one was hard. I feel really good okay. about the top four. So let's get into it. Number four is Kevin Durant. Yep, this is great. A lot on the line for KD. Number three, Paul George. Yeah. Big contract, mm -hmm. possibly, on the horizon yep. here. Um, what are you going to do in these playoffs? Are you going to be playoff P or something less? Number two, Luka Doncic. Ooh. If Luka does not go far, and I don't know what far necessarily needs to be. Does it need to be the Western Conference Finals? Does it just need to be a competitive second round that goes seven games? Like, whatever it has to be. But we, if, if they lose in the first round, we are going to have a summer of, can Luka get over the hump? Every star hits this window around this stage when they don't have a championship. Giannis, it happened to Giannis. It happened to Jokic a little bit. It's happening with Embiid. It happened with LeBron, right, before he won in 2012. Like, when you are this level, we start asking, okay, the production's been awesome. We all recognize you're one of the best players on the planet. When's that championship coming? If you lose now, if you're the Dallas Mavericks, people are going to start asking those questions. Number one, Jason Tatum. For all the same reasons I just laid out for Luka Doncic, plus the added part of you are clearly the best team in the league uh, during the regular season, the most wins, you have home court advantage, you have the most complete team, everything is lined up for you, except we all also recognize that you're not at the same level as Luka and Joker and all these other guys. But that makes I think that puts even more pressure on him to get up to that level. Because if the Celtics don't win the championship... Mm -hmm. It's going to be because of Jason Tatum. It's a great take. And that's why he's under the most It's a great pressure. take. Can I, here's the one name that I think should be on the list that I, I just want to throw at you. And maybe I'm too close to some okay. of this. Donovan Mitchell. Thought about it, but it feels like he's already made his decision. So, But it, like I think if he has another bad first-round series against an opponent that defends him a certain way, are we not going to think of him a little bit differently than what he is? Brendan already is. Brendan, Brendan, if if you listen to this, get this far, text us and let us know. Brendan is the captain of the Donovan Mitchell hater sh like yacht. Well, that'll be fun because you've had to deal with him as part of the Cleveland Cavaliers, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to have to deal <laughs> with him next year when Donovan Mitchell's playing for the Miami. Yeah, really excited to see what kind of fits Tyler Hero gets off in, like, December when it's, like, snowing in Cleveland. Oh, he's gonna. He's looking forward to that. Have you seen the like the rabbit hat that he's? Yeah, wearing? except the, except he could also the, the except that he can go to a yacht after the game. There's not exactly a yacht you can go. You can go to the good time on the lake in the middle of winter if you want, I guess. But like, which lake is it? Is it yeah. Erie? My guy, Wes, knowing his lakes. All right, so that number two. All right, so that's your pick. I had I had Nuggets Lakers. Uh, that was my pick. Where are you going? Going Wolf Suns. That's a good one. Um. A lot of pressure on both teams like the wolves have to like win a series to justify their very existence in terms of how much money they are spending the suns need to win to justify the amount of money they are spending on to be a professional basketball team neither team has really proven it in the biggest way there's a ton of star power all over the board including overlapping star power and in, in book and Ann at, at the shooting guard spot very contrasting styles in terms of how they play in terms of their head coaches I think this series could go a bajillion different ways. You could convince me of a lot of different things of how this is going to go. I think the the chaos factor possibility in that series is there. I mean, for all we know, like this, maybe like this is the series where all clicks for the Suns. Maybe the the Wolves' defense is just that good and eats them up. I could be convinced of a ton here. I can't wait to see how it plays out. It's a good pick. I probably should have picked them number two. Uh, you laid out all the reasons. The stakes for the Suns are so high. And there is a real possibility that they can lose to the Timberwolves. And I know that the Suns have had the Timberwolves number in the regular season, and that's great. Um, it don't mean nothing for this playoff series. Yeah, you got to win these games. And I don't trust the Suns even a little bit <laughs> in terms of uh, their consistency. 
Um, I don't know who I'd, I'm, I still haven't done the work enough to, to figure out like who I'm going to pick in this series. We're, Sun, we're submitting our, we're I'm, submitting our graphic, our, our picks for graphics. So people should find those on social. That one, I think I'm just firing from the hip. I'm just going to get there. And like, I'm just going to be like, what, sure whatever advice. my gut tells me in that moment is where we're going to end up. It feels like most people are going to be picking the Suns again, because they've pretty much owned the wolves in the regular season. And I get it. It's a fine pick. The Suns very well could win this series. I'll probably just pick the Wolves to be like a devil's advocate, and there's definitely some value in picking the higher seed with the home court advantage and the better defense in a first-round playoff series. I'm also very much here for Anthony Edwards just being like, actually, I'm the future Hall of Famer. I'm the best player on the court. Sorry, Kevin Durant. Move aside, Devin Booker. It's the Ant show now. Very excited to see Anthony Edwards in a playoff series, so that's going to be awesome too. Um, I feel like we've hit like the most... Uh, no, I, I think I, there's one other one on the board that I'm, I'm, I, I had close to, I had like as my clear number four. All right. I think I know where you're going with this and I don't think it's where I'm going to go with my okay. next pick. I'm taking the thunder versus the, AFC. okay. That's not where I was going. Okay. So I, I'm going to get my pick. Yeah, that's I'm, cool. It, we already laid out the thunder case. I just love watching this team. Um, when it comes to the first round, especially with the high seeds, we pretty much know what's going to happen. I could still really enjoy watching the high seeds, and this is going to be the first chance to see this Oklahoma City Thunder team and their young guys, Shea Gilgis, Alexander, Jalen Williams, heck, Mark Dagnall, like in a playoff series uh, versus whoever they go up against. I just think it, there's going to be a lot of sort of interesting data points to take away from this series, even if we know that Thunder are probably going to roll to a series win here. I'm just really interested to see like the first taste of this, the first experience, the first sort of episode of this budding whatever it is that's happening in Oklahoma City, this is sort of the first episode of it, the pilot, perhaps. Um, so excited to watch it. I'm going Sixers Knicks next. Yep, that's what I thought you were going. With. Like both teams, I think would really just like to win a series and get get somewhere. I think both teams would really like to get to a place where they feel like they're moving in the right direction. Jalen Brunson is fucking awesome, and I want to see what he does in this series. I think there's a lot of room for him to cook here. And what are just the 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 watching Embiid through, perhaps like me being scared about what he's gonna look like, like through my fingers. Like I I don't know, you know. Um, I don't know if that series will always be the prettiest. I think it could get pretty grimy, and and that makes it maybe not the most fun. It's also not going to be the grimy series in the Eastern Conference. Um, so that it is that going mm. forward at least. But I think there's just so much at stake there with some really high-level talent. And I, I think whoever wins... I, I think it's like a, it's a tough draw for the Knicks for where they ended up and what they accomplished in the regular season to end up with Philly. They're the team that draws that stick, but can they get over that hump? Um, and, and what does Embiid have to give is going to be really, really interesting. It's a good value pick. I think you're winning the draft. Um, if I knew Joel Embiid was healthy, I probably would have picked this series number two mm. uh, between Joel Embiid versus the Knicks. I love watching this Knicks team. They are so fun to watch. I love, I actually enjoyed watching Joel Embiid despite the foul baiting um, and all that stuff when this team was humming, like, this team was dominant and uh, they're actually have a, like a good coach now with Nick Nurse who does things that make the team better, which is valuable. And then in this series, you have like the added character of Madison Square Garden and everything that comes along with that, which I am a sucker for. No, that big same. So I like I like the celebrity cameos. I like when the the camera pans to Ben Stiller sitting in the second my, row. Like I mean, my one of my so. favorite things to do when I'm on Instagram, which is not always the healthiest things to do, but whatever. I look at the Knicks Instagram post and I see how many of the celebrities they have in their posts to see how many of them actually know who they are. Because sometimes I'm like, I have no idea who this is. That, that could be a segment. Yeah. Well, no, maybe like a maybe you know, a TikTok we break. did a we did um, a once we did a who would you have as your courtside like seat and mine was like Boy Genius and Paul Thomas Anderson and I think also would I would now add like Edgy Albert to my list um would would be where I would go, but I and you're sitting with these people yeah or they're there to, yeah or yeah you're sitting with them hanging out that would be like mine's like extremely white and kind of right. weird but you know what are we gonna do I'm extreme I'm I'm white I'm extremely white and extremely weird so what are you gonna do. Yeah, the Paul Thomas Anderson thing. Yeah, anyway. um, <laughs> it's like Boogie Night. It's a I'm, movie. It's it's a good yeah. pick. I'm going. Uh, I'm going Cavs. Magic this is. I, I'm really glad because I don't want to watch the series. If I'm being honest with you, like it's gonna not. The series is gonna be like yeah, ninety three to eighty to ninety one, like every game. Yeah, I'm. 
I'm probably going to regret this pick when I'm actually watching this thing on Paramount Plus, but um, I I really enjoy watching the Orlando Magic in a weird way, and Jalen Suggs going up against Donovan Mitchell to me is basketball nerd interesting. The Jonathan Isaac experience could be interesting. I'm here for Paolo Bencaro versus Evan Mobley. Yeah. Two young players who play the same position are budding and need to need is a strong word, but have an opportunity to prove something on a big stage. Um, even if is it is like sort of the sideshow of the of the first round. Uh, I'm here for that. Not gonna spend a lot of time on Cavs Magic. We can move on. But I will say this. There's one team with a lot at stake, your Cleveland Cavaliers. Mm-hmm. And there's another team with absolutely zero at stake, the Orlando Magic. And going back to vibes here, how do the Cavs respond to being under so much pressure? How do the Magic respond? Having absolutely no pressure to me is also interesting. Like, who's the loose team? Like, who comes out with a higher level of urgency? Like, all that stuff can be interesting. But the other part about the the Cavs is the team that gave them problems in the fi- in the playoffs last year was the New York Knicks because of their physicality. Well, the Orlando Magic provide a whole lot of that physicality also. So the Cavs learn from that experience and respond appropriately, I think is uh there's just some interesting storylines here, but um when there's a team with as much at stake as the Cleveland Cavaliers feel like they have at stake in here, it is at least No, I I think that's exactly right. And I do think there's a chance of like if Mitchell looks good, you have some great Mitchell stuff and that could at least be fun to watch in a vacuum and how does he even just Process, try to score in this setting against a really, really good defense. I think that that's that's all fair. Um, I'm really curious. I we I I don't. Want, I'm curious to see. I I think I know where Brennan's going. I'm on the record on another program that I pick Cavs in seven, and uh, we'll see if that's true. I'm curious to see how you guys pick that series. The betting line, and that's. I think I'm. I I gotta give it a little bit more thought, but I think I'm leaning your direction. I th- my instant reaction was like the opposite because I'm just like the, the Cavs vibes have just been so bad. Um, yeah, you got to get past that first layer of vibes. I think the vibe, like a very interesting first round this year. It never really felt like the vibes in every series were just <laughs> at, at polar opposite ends of the vibe spectrum. But it seems like we're there with so many of these series. But once you kind of peel back the vibes layer and you start getting under the hood and looking at the X's and O's and the mechanics of what the series actually could be like. Because vibes can change mm-hmm. really quick in the playoffs. Cavs vibes last year, tes- um, testament to that. Vibes were great, and then, yeah. Exactly. Uh, your pick. So, I think I'm going Pacers. But we got two more series on the yep, board, right? Pacers, Bucks, and Celtics versus the 8th seed. I'm going Pacers, Bucks. This is this might be like watching a car crash yep. in high speed, but you're getting Halliburton. You're maybe getting Giannis back. I mean, the Bucks, frankly, just got to survive. And there's a compelling case to pick Indiana just based on Giannis's health and based on Dame, you know, having some health issues in Middleton, you know, you never know how reliable that's going to really hold up. Like there's just a lot of, there's a, a ton at stake for Milwaukee. I mean, you could, I think the Suns, I think Milwaukee could, you could definitely have more at stake than the Suns. I, I think there's a case that this could all just implode right in front of us. If this doesn't go right for Milwaukee again in the first round. Um, we'll see where this ends up. We'll see when Giannis comes back, what he looks like, but not knowing his health, and understanding, like the the right. at least the Suns for all of like their, their excuse me the the Pacers for all of their issues and maybe Siakam hasn't fully worked out, you know Halliburton hasn't hit the peak he hasn't hit the highs that he hit early in the season. That's still a team that you would think you kind of understand what they're going to be with a good coach. Wouldn't shock me if that series goes long, and it wouldn't shock me if 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 the Pacers are, are a live threat to win it. Major upset uh, potential here, which adds to the entertainment value of the series. I actually might be leaning towards the Pacers at this point. It does not sound like Giannis is going to play in this series. And if he doesn't play, like, I don't know. Like, the Pacers have a good – like, they have the two – two of the best three players in the in the series if Giannis isn't playing, right, between Halliburton and Siakam. So that's where we're at. Um, it would rank higher, though – because there is a rivalry between these two teams. They, these two teams do not like no. each other. That has been abundantly made clear. The problem is that the main antagonist or protagonist, I suppose, depending on what side you're on, is not involved in this in this series. If it's Giannis, like it's it's like go, it's like uh, Bruce Willis instead of uh, fighting Hans Gruber. Like that whole like all of the first Die Hard was just Bruce Willis versus that weird German guy who didn't talk 
you know, for the whole the whole movie. Like it's just not as compelling anymore, right? And so um, when you don't have the main character and part of the rivalry here, then you do just kind of lose some of the sheen. Mine, it, but, yeah, upset. Pick them series. Here, Odds have it as a pick them series. Yeah. Do yeah. They? Wow. It makes sense with the uh, injury thing. All right, that leaves me with Celtics versus the eight seed. That's fine. It might might as well be my Miami Heat here, so I might have to be watching this series anyway. So I might as well draft it. I mean, at least you can see Boston do cool stuff. Yeah, um, it just feels like whatever cool stuff they're going to do in the first round is going to be the, an extension of the cool stuff that they were doing in the yeah. regular season because they're not going to have to ramp it up. Like, they don't have to hit that extra gear to win they, this series. They might not have to do that till so, the conference finals is the thing. Because th- they're getting the winner of they're getting the winner of Cavs Magic. So let me propose this to you now that we're in the 55th minute yeah. of the show. Um, Uh-oh. Jimmy Butler yeah. got hurt. Joel Embiid's yep. hobbled. Giannis yep. is hurt. The East could not have broken better. For the Boston Celtics. No, it could not have. If they lose, it's gonna be a catastrophe. Yeah. They're not gonna. Like they're gonna they're probably this team is probably gonna end up playing in the NBA finals. If they win the finals. Should we put an asterisk on it? <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Don't come at me, Boston fans. Uh it's fine. I'm just kidding. But are you are you? Um the fan base that likes to put the asterisks on yes. those things. I mean look, so. they, this is sh- this is setting up for them to have a pretty clean path in a way that none of the teams in the West we think are going to have that clean path. If they, if barring injury, barring just like this, this other things that availed them, which I think they, a lot of what they've done has a lot of what Boston's journey this year has been about is about removing and taking them away. Some of the stuff that didn't work for them. The path is just there. I mean, even like, let's just say Orlando beats Cleveland. Even if Orlando is really good defensively, Boston's, gonna solve that over a seven game series they have all the personnel to do it and Mm -hmm. jonathan isaac can't be everywhere defending everything and that's here jalen suggs isn't really exactly the prototypical defender you would want in that series they don't have the bigs to defend what boston's gonna do with porzingis right so like even that i'm just not really like plus if i'm them like it's possible they play like they go like 4-0-4-0 and maybe lose like one game in the Eastern Conference Finals, and are like sitting waiting a week while like the Nuggets and the Wolves are like bludgeoning each other to death. Yep, yep. I'm sure there's a lot of good value on uh, the Celtics going 12 and 0 to the finals. So maybe that's something. Yeah, I don't maybe know. that's a good prop. All right, let's end there. This has been the Just Basketball Show for Friday, April 19th. Playoffs are here, Wes. This is my favorite sports weekend of the year. NBA playoff opening weekend is. My absolute favorite time of the year. Just a ton of basketball, wall to wall. We'll have it all covered here. Come Monday, reacting to the opening weekend, reacting to the opening games. We'll see where things stand by then. Any hot takes we have coming out of those game ones, we'll have it all here for you. I'm Chris. That's Wes. Check out, we have Brendan Clean on as well. Three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, here on the Just Basketball Show. Enjoy the hoops. We'll talk to you soon.